Welcome to the wonderful world of electrons. So electrons are actually uh, very, very strange, but they're incredibly important because the behavior of the electrons actually determines the behavior of the atoms themselves. Let me give you an example of this. All right, the uh, largest airship ever um, was the Hindenburg, right? So this massive Zeppelin or blimp um, built by Germany and um, across the Atlantic Ocean I actually have a couple of pieces of mail that were actually carried on this in my collection and I also if you look down there in the corner you'll see that there's actually a small piece of duralumin which is um, the the metal that they or the alloy that they use to uh, make the the frame of the airship itself and on May 6th uh, 1937 the Hindenburg actually caught fire as it was attempting to land a uh, massive fire. There are videos of this, and it's it's pretty heart wrenching. Um, it crashed. There were 35 fatalities. And the question is why, right? Well, it turns out that the reason for this is because the airship itself was filled with hydrogen. Hydrogen is extremely flammable. So you think, well, what about what about the Goodyear blimp? Should be should we be worried about that bursting into flames? Well, it turns out that modern blimps are actually filled with helium instead, which is right next door to hydrogen on the periodic table. But because of the behavior of their electrons, these atoms actually have extremely different properties. Hydrogen is extremely flammable, whereas helium is completely inert and will not react. Now there are actually two main models uh, that allow us to better understand what's going on with the electrons in an atom. The first is the Bohr model, named after Niels Bohr, and the second is quantum mechanics. Now, the Bohr model helps us to explain something called the atomic emission spectrum, which um, it turns out that this is kind of like a fingerprint for each and every element. If you take an element, run electricity through it, zap it with enough voltage, it'll cause the electrons to jump up to higher energy levels. And when they drop back down, they'll actually give off uh, different frequencies of light. Okay? And each element actually has a very unique atomic emission spectrum, so it actually gives off different frequencies of light. So in the example here, hydrogen, you can see it gives off kind of a lavender color, a, you know, an indigo, kind of a, a turquoise green, and then also something that shifted up in the red area of the spectrum. So um, if you pass electricity through um, a tube containing hydrogen, this is the light that you'll actually get out of it. And you can run this through a spectroscope so you can separate it all out and everything. And the cool thing about this is it actually allows us to um, to figure out different elements, right? Um, before, uh, you know, all the modern technology, um, scientists were actually still able to identify elements based solely on their atomic emission spectrum. In fact, the story of helium is kind of interesting because helium was actually first discovered on the sun. You think, how in the world can you discover an element on the sun? There's no way to go there, right? And no way to take a sample or anything. And the reason for this is that um, chemists that were studying the atomic emission spectrum of the sun noticed that, sure enough, there was hydrogen, okay, and they could see the, the frequencies for hydrogen light being, or, you know, the, for hydrogen, the light being given off from the hydrogen itself. But they also found this new element that they didn't recognize. So they actually said, hmm, this is a new element, we'll call it helium, after Helios, the god of the sun. And it wasn't until maybe 80 years later that someone on you know, actually discovered helium was on Earth as well. So kind of a fascinating thing and a very, very useful technique for identifying, you know, uh, clear gases, right? I mean, you have a tube filled with, um, you know, helium or neon or oxygen or nitrogen, they're all going to look the same, but their atomic emission spectra will be very different. So what is the Bohr model? Well, the Bohr model is sometimes called the planetary model, and the idea is you can think of an atom as a miniature solar system with the nucleus at the center where the sun would be and the electrons would be these tiny little um, planets kind of orbiting the sun All right, and so each of these would be in a different orbit or um, what we'd call an energy level and it turns out you can have multiple electrons in some of the energy levels and so these electrons would kind of just you know move around kind of like planets orbiting the sun but what happens is every now and then you zap these with a little bit of energy, right? So you run electrical current through this to make an atomic emission spectrum and what happens is the electron will actually jump up to a higher energy level. And 
these energy levels are kind of like um, a ladder, right? Like the rungs on a ladder. So we all know that you can be, you know, you can step on a rung of a ladder, but you can't really step in between the rungs, right? You have to be on one or the other. Same thing here. The electron can be in the n equals 1 or n equals 2 or n equals 3 energy level, but it can't be at like 3.2 or 4.5. It has to be in one of those set energy levels. Now, if you've ever seen kids on Halloween, you'll see that they get all hyper and excited and they're on a sugar high, and eventually they end up crashing back down and go to sleep, right? So the same type of thing happens when you have an, an electron that gets bumped up to a higher energy level. It gets excited and it bumps up, but at some point it has to drop back down to where it was. So now the electron is back where it originally was, but um, the law of conservation of energy says that you cannot create or destroy energy. So what about the energy that went into this, um, you know, this electron to kick it up to that higher energy level? Where does that energy go? Well, it turns out that it gets kicked out as a photon of light with a very specific frequency that corresponds to the drop in the two energy levels. Or, um, and so this, this drop might be very, very small, or it might be a very large drop, and so the, the frequencies would, would change depending on how far this electron dropped, whether it was just a short drop or a large drop and so forth, and you'd get different colors or different frequencies of light, and that explains what's going on with this atomic emission spectrum, is that every atom has its unique set of orbits, um, and therefore the electrons have very set frequencies of light that they can give off. So that sounds great, and then the, the Bohr model helps us to kind of visualize things, but it turns out that it's woefully inaccurate, um, unfortunately. So uh, the the better theory, or the better model, would be quantum mechanics. And this is an extremely wonderful model. However, it predicts extremely strange behavior that's really hard for, for our minds to cope with. It's, it's, it's more, you know, stranger than, like, the bizarro science fiction that's out there. So the first thing we need to know about quantum mechanics is that in the Bohr model we had orbitals, right? Uh, or orbits in which the the electrons kind of like planets orbit the the nucleus. Now in quantum mechanics instead we actually have orbitals. Now an orbital isn't like a distinct region where you know the electron is. Instead it's a region where there's a high probability that an electron may be found. So for instance if I'm you know teaching at college and I look at the clock and it's 10 o'clock and so I can think you know what um, you know my my oldest daughter, daughter she's in middle school and so therefore um, you know, looks like it's about period two, so I, I kind of have an idea of where she could be, right? I have a very uh, clear understanding that she better be at the school, right? And she's probably in her classroom, but there's always a prob uh, you know, slight probability that she's in the restroom or that she, you know, went off to, you know, a special assembly or something in the auditorium. And so you don't know for sure exactly where the electron is in the orbital, but there's a high probability that it's somewhere within that. It's kind of like when, um, when you know, people are, are playing baseball. And when you have a major league pitcher, they, they throw the a fastball, and it's moving so fast that there's literally no time for the batter's, you know, eye to pick up the light bouncing off the baseball and then process that and then tell the batter where to swing. Instead, they just have to take a guess. So they look at, you know, initially where the, the you know, pitch is being thrown, and then they have to, to guess, like, oh, there's a high probability that it will, you know, be you know, low and to the outside or so forth, and they have to decide whether to swing. And so that's why you're never going to have someone that can bat 100% of the time because it really is just a guess of, you know, probability. All right, so the next thing we need to do is if we cannot describe exactly where an electron is, um, instead, why don't we go ahead and give it like an address, all right, um, a set of, of numbers that tell us, you know, uh, kind of describes where the electron lives. And again, we don't know exactly where it's at at any one moment, but we can we can describe where it might be, kind of like giving someone's address. You don't know where they're at within their house, but at least you know that they're probably at home at some point. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define a value for n. This is the principal energy level, or shell. You can kind of think of an atom as like an onion, right, with different layers or different shells. 
and the electrons can be in any one of those shells. And in fact, in large atoms, you have electrons in all of the shells, right? We're going to number those shells um, as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so forth, and we can go on as far as we want. We're going to designate the shells with the, the symbol lowercase n. All right, so I'll talk about n equals 1, or the n equals 4 energy level. The next thing that you should know about it is that the lower the value for n, the closer to the nucleus it is. So n equals 1 is the very smallest energy level, and then it gets a little bigger and a little further from the nucleus, and that's n equals 2, and then n equals 3, and n equals 4, as we kind of move out away from the nucleus. Now that we have defined what a shell is, what about the subshells? Well, subshells are kind of the subdivisions within the shell itself. All right, so these are going to be identified by letters. Those letters are S, P, D, F, and we actually go alphabetical from there, you know, G, H, and so forth, but we usually just talk about S, P, D, and F. All right, S is the lowest in energy. F is the highest in energy out of those four, and we move in that direction. Now, each of the subshells contains an orbital, or actually more than one orbital. And the letter of the subshell tells you how many orbitals you have. So for instance, if I have an S subshell, I know that it contains only one orbital. And one very important thing that you should remember is that each and every orbital maxes out at two electrons. You can have less than that, but you cannot have more than two electrons. So that means that if I have an S subshell, it has one orbital, which means it can hold a maximum of two electrons. The P subshell contains three different orbitals. Each one of those contains two electrons, or can contain two electrons, giving us a total of six. D has five orbitals, which means a max of ten electrons. And F is seven, which gives us fourteen. So it turns out that I think these are easy to remember, because you'll notice that with our orbitals here, our number of orbitals, we just count by odd numbers, right? So 1, 3, 5, 7. And then as long as we remember that each and every orbital maxes out at 2 electrons, we can just multiply those numbers by 2 to tell us how many electrons can fit in each one of those subshells. Now, each of those orbitals has a very specific shape, all right? And turns out that the s orbital has a spherical shape. So if I were to, you know, attempt to draw an s orbital, it would literally just look like just a nice little sphere, and that's a horrible sphere. <laughs> okay, um, so that would be maybe like an n equals 1 um, s orbital, right? And then n equals 2 s orbital, or, or the 2 s would just be a larger one, and then you get a larger one on top of that, and so forth. But turns out that that's only part of the story. We also have p orbitals. p orbitals are a little more complex. So the p orbitals are kind of dumbbell shaped. You have one going in the y direction, one in the x direction, and one in the uh, z direction. And so you have three different p orbitals, remember. And each one of those can hold up to two electrons. So I always think of s meaning spherical, and p meaning peanut, because they're kind of peanut shaped. Um, they actually don't stand for that. They stand for like sharp, principal, diffuse, and so forth. But, um, you know, that's how I remember them. And then once you go past that, then you hit the D orbitals, and those are kind of cloverleaf shaped, except for one that kind of looks like a P orbital with a, you know, donut around it. And they get all really bizarre after that. So just kind of be aware that each and every orbital has a very specific shape. So when you see the clip art for an atom, and it just has this nice little thing in the center, and then it has... You know, you've seen this before, right? And it looks kind of like that, except pretty. Um, that's totally incorrect, so it doesn't work at all. It's much, much, much more complex than that. So we now understand about the um, different things, that the subshells, the shells, and so forth. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to use that to put together an address, right? And this address, or this electron configuration, is just a shorthand notation that allows us to describe how the electrons are arranged within an atom itself. So let me give you an example of this. So here we have the nitrogen atom. If you look at your periodic table, you'll see that nitrogen is atomic number 7, which means it has 7 protons. So a neutral nitrogen atom also has to have 7 electrons. 
Now those electrons, those seven electrons, will be arranged throughout the atom. And what I want you to see here is that these electrons, where we've placed them in certain orbitals. So the, the coefficient, right, you can see the 1 and the 2 and the 2 here, that designates the value for n. So this first one, that's um, you know an s subshell within the n equals 1 energy level. All right, the next thing would be that the letters themselves designate um, you know what which subshell they're in. So this one is in the s subshell, and these ones are in an s subshell, and these ones are in a p subshell. Okay. Now the next thing is you'll also see some superscripts, and the superscripts are these little numbers up here. So that tells us how many electrons are actually within that subshell. So for instance, here in the 1s subshell, we have two electrons. In the 2s subshell, we have two electrons. In the 2p subshell, we have three electrons. Now remember again that s's have one orbital, right, which means that they can hold two electrons. P's can, there are three different p orbitals within that subshell for a maximum of six electrons. So in this case, we only have three in there, even though it could hold more than that. And then remember that D's, there are five, which gives us a maximum of ten electrons there. And F's, there are seven of those within the subshell, giving us a max of fourteen electrons that we can place within that if we need to. Now what does this actually mean? Well, this means that we can somehow set up an electron configuration that explains where these electrons are at. Now in order to do this, we're actually going to use something called an Aufbau diagram, Aufbau which is German for building up, and we are going to kind of use this chart to build up where the electrons go. So you can see in this chart that I've drawn, which is very, very fancy looking, I know, you can see that I have um, the 1 through 7s, and then I skip a step here, and then I go with the p's, right, 2 through 7p, I skip a step, 3d through 7d, skip a step, 4f through 7f, all right? Now, once you've written that out, the important thing to remember is that where the star is here on the bottom, that is where we always start. We start with the lowest energy electrons, okay? Um, they always fill up the, the lowest energy, all right? And we're actually going to fill them in this diagonal pattern. So the electrons, the first two electrons, because remember we could fit a maximum of two electrons in the S, we can fit up to six in the P, we can fit up to ten in the D, and fourteen in the F. Some people like to write those numbers at the top just to help them remember. All right, so we could put the first two electrons in the 1s, then once that's full, we can fit two electrons in the 2s, then we could fit six of them in the p, and then another two in the 3s, and so forth, and we just keep doing this until we run out of electrons. So for instance, if we run out after the 4d, we don't have any more electrons to work with, then we stop there. So let me go ahead and give you a couple of examples of this, because I know it's strange and it seems really weird, but um, hopefully this will explain how to actually work the problems. So we're going to go ahead and um, attempt to write out the electron configuration for calcium. So the first thing you would do is you would actually look up on your periodic table and see that calcium is atomic number 20, which means we need to find a home for the first 20 electrons, right? Um, after that, we're done. So where do we start? Well, we're always going to start right here where the star is. So we're going to start with the 1s. So I'm going to go ahead and write out 1s. And remember, if you want to, you can write these up here. 2, 6, 10, oh, that's a really lousy, 10, and 14 electrons that we can fit in each of those subshells. And remember that it does not matter what the value for n is. So the 1s subshell can hold 2. The 5s subshell can hold 2. The 7s subshell can hold 2. It doesn't matter. So um, we start with the 1s, and I can fit two electrons there, so I put a superscript 2. Now that's completely full, so let's go ahead and fill up the 2s. So I'm going to put 2s, and remember that that can also hold 2, because it's an s subshell. Now I go ahead and fill up the 2p. The 2p, this can actually hold six electrons, right, because it's a p subshell. 
I keep going and I fill up the 3s and that can hold 2 alright and then I keep going I fill up the 3p that can hold 6 fill up the 4s that can hold 2 let me go ahead and count my electrons really quick so I'm just going to uh, make a little mark so I have 2 4 10 12 18 20 okay so normally you don't have to actually make those little marks there uh, but I've just found a home for all 20 electrons so I've just written the ground state electron configuration for calcium okay now let me go ahead and try the same thing but with uh, a bigger atom alright because this is going to be a little more challenging now in this case we have iodine okay so iodine is going to be a bit more tricky because if you look at your periodic table you see that it actually has 53 electrons so I need to find a home for all 53 of those so where do I start same place we always start <laughs> at the uh, the star there so I'm going to start with the 1s2 then 2s2 right, so I filled up the 1s then the 2s then next comes the 2p6 then the 3s2 then I hit the 3p6 and 4s2 after that notice that now I hit the D so I have 3d and how many can I fit in the D? I can actually fit a maximum of 10 so let's go ahead and put all 10 electrons in there after that I hit the 4p 4p and I'm actually going to drop down here normally you'd write them all side by side but I'm just running out of space 4p6 and then 5s2 after that I hit the 4d how many can I fit in there 10 because it's a D after that I hit 5p but I'm going to go ahead and stop and check for a second see how many electrons I actually have used so far so this is 2 4 10 12 18 20 30 36 38 48 okay so 48 um, so I've used 48 electrons that means I only have um, what is that five more electrons left alright so where am I going to go ahead and put those five electrons Let's clear out all these little dashes I'm going to go ahead and put those five electrons in the 5p subshell now remember that the the p subshell could actually hold six if we needed it to but we don't have that many electrons right we've already um, filled up all you know are used up all 53 of our electrons so this would be the ground state electron configuration for iodine so these aren't so bad right I mean really all we're doing is we're just figuring out how many electrons we have and then slowly filling them up through that little alphabet diagram until we run out of electrons and then we're done so let's go ahead and write a few more and then I'm going to show you something called the noble gas notation which is a shorthand notation that emphasizes the valence electrons because remember that the valence electrons are the outermost electrons these are the highest energy ones these are the ones that are actually interacting with other atoms when they collide so let's go ahead and uh, write it out for sodium so sodium is number 11 on the periodic table so we're going to go ahead and start with 1s let's write 1s2 after that we hit the 2s 2s2 then we hit 2p, 2p6, and then the 3s. But notice that we all, we've already used 2, 4, 10. That gives us 11. So we've already used all 11 of our electrons. So that would be the ground state electron configuration for uh, sodium. All right. Now, um, let me go ahead and try writing it out for bromine. All right. A little more complex because now we have 35 electrons just like always we start at 1s and this kind of becomes like a mantra right we're like 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 and so forth because as you you know get used to these it just kind of comes naturally all right then we hit the 
four s two. We've used two, four, ten, twelve, eighteen, twenty. We still have a bunch more. Oh, the three D gives us ten. And then the four P. Actually, I think we need five there. So that gives us two, four, ten, twelve, eighteen, twenty, thirty, thirty-five. Okay, perfect. So that accounts for all thirty-five of our electrons, right? Now the trick is, though, is that this gets to be a pain, right? To sit there and like write out 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and so forth, especially for some really massive ones like you know uranium. This would be a huge pain because something like uranium, you have 92 electrons to work with. Oh, that's a headache. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you the um, noble gas notation. Now, this is a little bit tricky. Some people like it. Some people are like, why would we do that? It seems like so much work. But the noble gas notation shows us how many valence electrons something has. And it kind of emphasizes those ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to locate um, sodium on the periodic table, which is a little hard to see here because it's so small. But there's sodium. And I'm actually going to count back uh, until I hit the, um, you know, the noble gas. But I actually like to just go to the end of the row and go up one. Okay, So that right there. Um, that noble gas is neon, all right? So I'm going to actually write brackets, square brackets, and put neon in those square brackets. And then remember that neon actually contains 10 electrons, right? Because it's atomic number 10. So what I'm doing is I'm saying the first 10 electrons in sodium exactly match those in neon, all right? And then notice that sodium is in column 1, 2, 3. Right, or row, sorry, row three. And so I'm actually going to pick up at the 3s, and I'm going to go ahead and put the last electron there, because that gives me 10 electrons here and one electron there, which gives me a grand total of, oops, gives me a grand total of 11 electrons. So instead of writing 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, I can just write square brackets with neon in there, and then 3s1, and then that tells me um, you know, that gives me the noble gas notation because it's just saying everything's the same through neon and then you've got an extra electron there at the end. So let me go ahead and try that with this next one. All right, so this one is bromine, right? And so bromine, if we look at our periodic table, is right here. Oops, that's the eraser. Let's see. Bromine is right there, okay? And so if I go over to the end of the row and bump up one right there, that is argon, okay? So um, argon contains 18 electrons because it is atomic number 18. So what I'm really saying is, hey, the first 18 electrons, oops, first 18 electrons look exactly like those in argon. And then bromine is in row one, two, three, four. It's in row four, therefore I pick up at the 4s and then I just continue on as normal, right? So 4s2, after that I hit the 3d, so 3d10, after that I hit the 4p, and 4p5. All right, so um, there's either the longhand notation that tells us where every single electron is, or we can kind of shortcut it and say, you know what? I'm going to use this noble gas to you know, show what the first 10 or 18 or however many electrons look like, and then I'm going to pick up from there. So the really cool thing about the periodic table, or one of the really cool things, is that it's actually set up with all of these electron configurations in mind. And you know, remember that the periodic table was, you know, was like designed long, long, long before this idea of electron configurations ever you know, took place. But it just goes to show that the properties of the, the elements really are driven by the electron configurations. So let me just show you what I mean. All right, so how many electrons can fit in the S subshell? Two, correct? And notice how there are two um, blocks right here. So that's what we call the S block. How many can fit in the P subshell? Well, we can fit a total of six, right? Notice that there are, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six in the P block, right? So I should actually write 
that this is the P block. All right, how many in the D block? Well, you can imagine that the D block would actually contain 10, right? So notice here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this would be what's known as the, the D block. And then the last one you can guess is the F block, and that contains 14. And if we look down here at the F block, you'll see that there are exactly 14 elements that direction. So the cool thing about this is that you can actually use this to predict what the electron configuration is for any, electron, or for any atom without even going through that whole thing that we just did. So for instance, rubidium is right here. It's in the first column of the S block, so I know that it's going to end in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's going to end in 5S1. Francium down here is going to end in 7S1. Magnesium is going to end in 1, 2, 3, 3S2. Or something like sulfur is going to end in 1, 2, 3, it's going to end in um, 3p1234, 3p4. So I don't recommend that you try to you know, use this right away, but once you kind of familiarize yourself with this idea of electron configurations, then this can come really, really in handy. And it turns out that some periodic tables actually have the electron configurations written out for all the elements already on there, which is really, really nice. Now that we can actually see how the periodic table is designed with the electron configurations in mind, uh, let's actually see how we can use the periodic table to determine how many valence electrons something has. Because, you know, we could go ahead and, you know, do this the hard way. And what we would do there is we would say, hmm, let's look at phosphorus. It's element number 15. I can write out the electron configuration for that. And then I can see that the highest value for n is 3. And that I have a total of 2 plus 3, I have a grand total of 5 valence electrons in this thing. But that takes a bit of work, right? Well, instead, what I can do is, instead of doing it that way, I can actually simply look at the Roman numeral on top of the column. And this only works for the main group or the A group elements, not the transition metals or the inner transition metals. But it will actually tell me how many valence electrons something has. So, for instance, here's phosphorus right here. Notice that's it's in column 5, so it has 5 valence electrons. So this has 1. Everything in column 2a has 2 valence electrons. These have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, right? So you can you know, either write out the entire electron configuration, or you can just look at the top of the column and see how many valence electrons something has. So if I said, how many valence electrons does magnesium have? You would say, oh, it has 2 because it's in column 2a. Now this um, actually helps us to understand why elements form the ions that they do because remember that um, atoms really want to follow the octet rule, right? Octet meaning, oops, back up for a second. Octet meaning 8. Alright, so most atoms really, really, really want to have eight valence electrons. Now why would they do this? Well, it turns out that they're more stable when they have a filled S subshell and a filled P subshell. The S subshell can hold two, the P subshell can hold six, two plus six is eight. Therefore we have the octet rule. Now, um, remember that the noble gases um, don't like to make ions because they already have eight valence electrons. So they don't want to, you know, uh, lose or gain any electrons. The elements in column 7a all have 7 valence electrons, so they really want to gain one more, which is why they like to form a negative 1 charge. Here, we like to form a negative 2 charge, because they're in, they have 6 electrons, they want 2 more. In column 5a, they need 3 more electrons to have an octet. And if we skip over to column 1a, they have um, 1 valence electron. They can either gain 7 more so that they can have an octet and be cool like the noble gases, or they can just lose that one valence electron, which peels off the outer layer of their little oniony atom, that, that outermost energy level. And then inside, remember that we have that you know, kind of pre-filled shell within it. So it's much easier to lose one. So that's why these guys will form a plus one. Column 2a forms a plus two. Column 3a forms a plus three. 
And then column 4a is weird because it could either gain 4 or lose 4 electrons. They don't typically do either. They don't usually like to form ions. So carbon and silicon, for instance, like to really, or they really like to form um, covalent bonds, a sharing of electrons rather than trying to transfer electrons from one atom to another. Now I don't want you to memorize the periodic table. I don't think that's useful. I don't spend my time, you know, memorizing it. Um, I, you know, have some of it memorized just because, you know, I use those atoms a lot. But what I do want you to know is I want you to understand a couple of basic trends about the periodic table. And remember that these are trends, that there are always exceptions to these rules, or, you know, they're not even rules, they're just trends. Um, but the two that I want you to know are atomic size or atomic radius, which is, you know, how big the atom is, and then also ionization energy. All right. Now, in each of these cases, there are going to be two rules, and remember that rule number one always takes precedence, and then if it's a tie for rule number one, then you go ahead and apply rule number two. So let me show you what I mean. The first trend is for atomic size or radius, and what this is is that um, whenever you have an atom, or let's say that you have two atoms, and you're trying to decide which of the two are larger. So let's say you have oxygen and you have um, polonium and you want to know which atom is larger. Well, the rule number one says that size always increases as you move down the periodic table. All right, So polonium will definitely be the larger of the two because it is um, further down on the periodic table. So that's quick and easy, right? If I say uh, magnesium versus osmium, osmium is further down on the periodic table, therefore it's going to have a larger atomic radius. Now, if they're um, you know, in different rows, then it's pretty easy. But what if it was something like potassium versus krypton? So in this case, they are in the same horizontal row. So rule number one doesn't really apply because it's a tie. So now we're going to actually apply rule number two, or trend number two, which says that size increases as you move left to right. So potassium is actually going to be the larger of the two atoms. It'll have a larger atomic radius. And this actually makes sense if you think about it, because rule number one says that each time you move down in a column, it's going to get larger. And this is because each time you, you know, move down one step, you are actually adding another principal energy level. So you have n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And remember that those get larger as you move down. Now, what about the second trend, which says that um, size increases as you move from right to left. Well, notice that both of these are in the n equals 4 energy level. So, you know, relatively speaking, they have about the same size. But potassium only has 19 protons holding those electrons in, and krypton actually has 36. So it almost has twice the number of protons kind of pulling on those electrons, kind of sucking it in, right? And so therefore, krypton would be slightly smaller than potassium, all right? Now, what's the, the next thing? This is ionization energy. Ionization energy is defined as the energy needed to remove an electron from a neutral atom. So if I have a sodium atom, just a neutral sodium atom, just going along, you know, in its normal day, and if I want to pull away an electron from it, I have to put in the ionization energy, the IE. And this makes sense because remember that in the nucleus you have protons which are positively charged. The electrons are negative, so they're opposite charges and they attract each other. So it's kind of like two magnets with opposite poles. They, they attract, right? And so you're going to have to put in some energy to actually remove that electron from the atom. It doesn't really want to leave. Even though we said that sodium wants to give up an electron, it's still going to put up a bit of a fight. So let me give you an example of this. All right. So, um, well, actually, let me just give you the other uh, the rationale behind this. It turns out that um, ionization energy will actually decrease as atomic size increases, or atomic radius, which means that the bigger the atom, the smaller the ionization energy. The smaller the atom, the bigger the ionization energy, which means that the trends that we just saw for atomic radius will be the exact opposite for ionization energy. Now, does this make sense? Well, yeah, it actually makes a lot of sense. All right, so I have three little kids, and when they go trick-or-treating, um, 
you know, they they end up getting a whole bunch of candy. And then as a responsible parent, you know, I have to check the candy. I have to eat, you know, the uh, Milky Way Midnights and Snickers bars and so forth. It's kind of my job, you know. It's just what I have to do. And so uh, my kids just don't seem to understand this. And so it's actually a struggle to kind of pull away a candy bar from them, even though they should be gladly giving their, their old man as, you know, 90% of the candy, but they just don't seem to want to. So if I want to remove a candy bar from, you know, one of their buckets, what do I do? Well, I have a choice. If it's in their hand, notice that the distance between the candy and their hand is very, very small, right? So if I actually try to reach in and pluck away a little candy bar of happiness, um, that's going to take a lot of energy, right? I have to sit there and, like, fight them off in order to do this. Not easy at all. So that's way too much work. So what do I do? Well, I go ahead and say, before you um, you eat some candy, why don't you go get your pajamas on so you're nice and comfortable, and then you can eat some candy. So they go running off, you know, and I say, oh, I'll hold on to your candy and make sure it's safe. They go running off, get changed, and now they're really, really far away. So they're, you know, way over here, and their candy is way over here. The distance is much larger, which means it's so much easier to pluck away a little candy bar, right? It still takes some energy because I have to kind of peek down the hallway and make sure they're not coming, but it's so much easier than wrestling it away from their grubby little hands. Same thing happens with ionization energy. If, you know, the atom or the nucleus is way over here, the electron's way over here, then it's easy to pull it away, right? You still have to put in a bit of energy, but it's not too much. Whereas if the electron is, you know, here and, you know, really close, and the nucleus is over here really close, it's going to take a lot of energy to pluck away that electron. It's going to be much, much, much more difficult. So let's see this in action. Um, let's just look at the trend. So the trend says for ionization energy, as you move down a column, the ionization energy is actually going to decrease. And then as that's the, the first most important rule, right? So if I'm talking about carbon versus lead, and I say, which one has the higher ionization energy? You'd say, oh, as we move down the column, it's actually decreasing. So carbon would have a much larger ionization energy. Now, that works great, except if they're in the same column again, right? So strontium versus something like tin, which one has the higher ionization energy? Well, because they're in the same row, we can't use um, you know, the rule number one, so instead we use rule number two, which says that as we move from left to or from right to left, the ionization energy decreases. And so therefore, tin would have the higher ionization energy. And again, these are just trends. There are plenty of exceptions to these. But um, overall, if you, you, know, you just want a quick and dirty answer about like, oh, what to expect, well, this works out pretty well. So if I said, um, oh, and then one more thing. What if I tried to trick you? What if I said, um, which one has the higher ionization energy? Boron, okay, or iodine. All right, well, in this case, um, iodine is further down, but boron is further to the left. And so which one would you expect? Well, remember that rule number one takes precedence. And so therefore, um, uh, iodine is further down, so it would have a lower ionization energy. Boron is further up, so it would have a higher ionization energy. And what I usually do is I just look at it and I say, okay, I know that iodine is the larger atom because it's further down. Therefore, boron has to have the higher ionization energy because I know the two trends are exact opposite. The larger the atom, the smaller the ionization energy, and vice versa. So this is electrons, right? If you, um, you know, go ahead and Google quantum mechanics, you'll find out there's like a Nova special that's really good that, that talks about this um, and some of the bizarre applications and, um, you know, of uh, quantum mechanics. And you'll see that it really is very strange, really interesting. We don't need to go into it, you know, in too much depth here at this level, but a very fascinating field. All right, I'll see you next time. So to illustrate how strange electrons actually behave, let me go ahead and show you a quick uh, illusion here. All right, so this time I'm not even going to use 
the full deck, right? <laughs> My wife's always accusing me of not playing with the full deck. Um, but um, what we have is I'm going to go ahead and use the tens, the four tens, all right? Um, kind of hard to space them out exactly right. But so here are the four tens. We'll go ahead and treat those kind of like electrons. And I have um, four blank cards. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put the, the four blank cards here. And what happens is, is that um, these cards can actually um, kind of transfer and move around. A lot like electrons can jump from um, orbital to orbital, right, in the Bohr model. So for instance, I can go ahead and rub that blank card on there and turn that into a ten of spades. I can actually rub this blank card on the back of my ten of spades. And by doing that, I can actually make that card become blank, right? I can take this blank card and go ahead and rub it on the ten of diamonds. And by doing that, I make another ten of diamonds. But it gets crazier, right? Because I can actually rub this on the back, and now I can make a double-sided ten of diamonds. And I can actually go ahead and stamp this a couple of ways, right? The clubs and the hearts, and therefore get both of those. Now I can even take this a step further. I can go ahead and rub this um, card on my shirt. Okay, my, I have a green shirt on. And sure enough, it turns green. And I can have, even take this uh, ten of hearts, place it directly up against the box, and by peeling this off of the box, I can make a copy of the box. So remember that this is a lot like um, electrons, right? They behave very, very strangely, do some things that really seem out of this world, but it all has to do with the electrons themselves and quantum mechanics and the laws that govern these extremely small subatomic particles. All right, I'll see you next time.